Ms Hall. Commissioner, in this final part of this round of hearings, we will draw together some of the themes we've explored in the life insurance and general insurance case studies and consider the regulation of the insurance industry as a whole. We'll do that through two witnesses. The first is Mr Robert Whelan, who is the CEO of the Insurance Council of Australia. The Insurance Council of Australia is the peak representative body for the general insurance industry and is responsible for the general insurance code of practice. The second is Ms Sally Lone, the CEO of the Financial Services Council. The Financial Services Council is the peak representative body for the life insurance industry and is responsible for the life insurance code of practice. In addition to Mr Whelan and Ms Lone, the Commission also sought witness statements from the bodies responsible for monitoring compliance with the General Insurance Code of Practice and the Life Insurance Code of Practice. They are the Code Governance Committee and the Life Code Committee. I want to tender those statements, Commissioner. For the Code Governance Committee, I tender the witness statement of Linnell Briggs, dated the 14th of September 2018. That statement becomes Exhibit 6.401. And for the Life Code Compliance Committee, I tender the witness statement of Anne Brown, dated the 28th of August 2018. Becomes Exhibit 6.402. Commissioner, I call Mr Robert Whelan. Mr Whelan, could I trouble you to come into the witness box and just remain standing for a moment uh, while I ask whether you'd prefer to be sworn or uh, make an affirmation. Sworn, thank you. Can thank you, you swear the witness, please. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Mr. Whelan. Do sit down. Yeah, Mr. Bell. Uh, Mr. Whelan, is your full name Robert William Whelan? Yes. In your business address, level 456 Pitt Street, Sydney, New South Wales, 2000? Yes. And you are an executive director and the chief executive officer of the Insurance Council of Australia? That's correct. And you've received, I understand, a summons uh, to appear at this stage of the uh, hearings uh, uh, dealing with rubric 6.61. Uh, do you have a copy of that summons with I you? I do. Uh, tend to that, Mr Commissioner. Uh, exhibit 6.403, the summons to Mr Whelan. And uh, you've prepared a report in relation to rubric 6, uh, slash 6 one, I understand? Yes. Uh, and do you have a copy of that uh, report with you? And are the contents of that report true and correct? And to the extent that the report expresses opinions, are they opinions you truly hold? They are. I tend to that as well, Mr Commissioner. Statement of Mr Whelan and its uh, annexures in relation to rubric 6-61. Uh, uh, statement's dated what date? Uh, I think it's 27th of August 2018, <coughs> Mr Commissioner. Thank you. Becomes exhibit 6.404. Thank you. Yes, Ms Hall. Uh, Mr Whelan, you've been the CEO of the Insurance Council of Australia since March 2010. That's correct. Uh, and the Insurance Council of Australia, or the ICA as I'll refer to it, is the peak representative body for the general insurance industry. That's right. Uh, it was established in 1975. Yes. Uh, and it replaced various state-based associations for general insurers, which trace their origins back to 1869. Yes. Any company licensed under the Insurance Act to conduct a general insurance business can be a member of the ICA. Yes. Uh, and at the moment, the ICA has 50 members. Yes. Uh, and they represent about 92% of all general insurance business in Australia. That's right. What are the main functions of the ICA, Mr Whelan? Uh, the main functions are we represent the, the general insurance industry in a range of areas that uh, go to how the industry is conducted, how the industry is regulated, and the, the types of laws and regulations that affect the industry. We uh, lobby for... Uh, 
the industry's interests. Uh, we look to build uh, trust in the industry amongst the general community. We also look for ways in which we can improve the consumer outcomes within the industry uh, and assist the industry in raising its uh, overall standards of service delivered to the customer uh, through our code of practice. Now, you've said that one of the ICA's objectives uh, is to build trust in the industry, is that right? That's right. Now, the ICA is governed by a board. That's right. And the members of the board are all representatives of the ICA's members. Yes. Uh, the board includes Helen Troop, who gave evidence on behalf of Cominshaw last week. Yes. Uh, and Gary Dransfield, who gave evidence on behalf of Suncorp yesterday. Yes. Now, in 2017, the ICA established a consumer liaison forum. That's right. And can you tell us what that is? That uh, consists of uh, representatives from the Insurance Council uh, and uh, representatives from the uh, main consumer lobby groups. Uh, and we meet uh, regularly throughout the year. Uh, we have an independent chair uh, that assists us to work through an agenda which is brought to us uh, by the consumer groups. The intent of the uh, forum is to provide a process by which key issues that are of interest and concern to consumers are brought to the Insurance Council through this mechanism where those, uh, those issues are defined and debated and discussed uh, about how the industry may respond to some of those issues and uh, the outworkings of, those, of that forum are reported directly to the board on a regular basis. Now, does that body, the Consumer Liaison Forum, have access to the ICA board? It does if it needs to. Mm -hmm. And how does it do that? Uh, it can request uh, to uh, present at the board. Uh, it can do that through the independent chair or uh, other, other means, but essentially uh, the management group uh, represents the outworkings of the uh, forum to the board on a regular basis through a reporting mechanism, and that's made uh, transparent to the consumer groups as well. And what are some of the key issues that that body has brought to the ICA's attention? Well, there's quite a number, um, and uh, they're, they're well canvassed across the constituents that they, they deal with, but uh, the sorts of things that have been brought to our attention are things like uh, uh, vulnerable consumers uh, in particular, and that's a, that's a major issue that we've been contending with uh, over the last uh, uh, year and a half. Um, and things such as uh, unfair contract terms uh, are, are another issue that gets raised with us. Uh, so there's uh, several issues around that type, of, uh, that type of thing that they bring to us. Any other key issues that they've brought to your attention? Uh, family violence is a particular issue that was raised with us that uh, uh, they were looking for uh, an input to the, uh, the code of practice to assist with people who uh, have difficulties with family violence and, and, and processing their claims and so on. Um, and uh, disclosure, uh, I think that's a, another issue that is of concern, uh, needing to improve our methods of informing customers about the uh, contracts that they have. What are the sorts of issues that people who are victims of family violence experience in their insurance claims? I think it's a, uh, most of the time it's a confusion about how uh, a particular policy is, is affected uh, when a claim is made. It may be a particular partner may take an interest in a policy uh, and uh, not inform the other partner uh, of that interest. Uh, the claim may be made, the claim may be paid, the other party may not know anything about that particular, uh, that particular claim. Um, so it's a complex area. Um, there's matters of law to, to be able to navigate as well as privacy issues. Uh, to try and put some effect to that, we've uh, brought in uh, a, a specialist lawyer, Ian Enright, uh, a legal insurance lawyer, uh, who, uh, who is assisting us to work through some of these issues as well. And it's also being incorporated into the new version of the Code of Practice, which is due to be uh, put in place next year. And what will be incorporated into the new code of practice to reflect these difficulties? 
So what we'll be asking uh, all our member companies that are signatories to the code is to uh, have uh, in their operations uh, vulnerable consumers uh, uh, teams uh, trained to be able to respond and identify these sorts of issues when they're in, uh, working with customers. Um, they will be required within six months of uh, the, the code being launched to have a policy, a clear and articulated policy about how they get, will go about dealing with family violence issues within their organisation. So, and we've got guidance built into the code of practice as a way of as assisting uh, the companies to be able to build that, uh, that policy to make it a meaningful and useful policy. Now, the ICA's main source of revenue is from its members, is that right? Yes. And in each of the last five financial years, the income uh, of the ICA from membership fees and levies has been between $8.7 million and $9.6 million? Yes. The ICA is responsible for publishing and maintaining the code, the General Insurance Code of Practice, is that right? Yes. Uh, and that code was first developed in 1994? Yes. Uh, now, could you explain why the code was introduced? Well, it was uh, accepted at the time by the government that uh, there needed to be uh, some form of self-regulation within uh, the general insurance industry and the government at the time, uh, from, from what I understand, uh, accepted that codes of practice were an appropriate way of doing that. Um, and it evolved pretty much from that point in time on an ongoing basis through to where it is today. You tell us in your statement at paragraph 126 mm -hmm. that in 1993 the Commonwealth Government announced it was intending to introduce a compulsory code of practice mm -hmm. for the general and life insurance industries. Mm -hmm. And in 1994, following extensive lobbying by general insurers, the Commonwealth Government announced that it would allow the insurance industry to develop a self-regulatory code instead of imposing a statutory code. Mm -hmm. That's what occurred? Yes. So that lobbying was successful in moving away from the government's idea of a compulsory code of practice uh, into a self-regulatory code. Mm -hmm. That's correct? Yes. All right. Now, was there anything in particular in the early 1990s that prompted a call for a compulsory code of practice for the insurance industry? Uh, look, not that, I can, not that I'm aware of. Um, but the general insurance code of practice was introduced as the industry's favoured alternative to a compulsory code. Yes. And there's been some version of the code in force since the 1st of July 1996. Yes. Now, since you became CEO in March 2010, there have been three versions of the code? Three reviews, yes. And three, uh, three versions uh, following reviews of the code, is that right? There's, I think there's two versions that, while I've been I here, a third version is in the, in the mix now. I see. Uh, there was one that was in force between May 2010 and June 2012, yes, is that right? there were some amendments uh, to, there was a, an extraordinary amendment to the existing code due to the uh, disasters that occurred in Queensland in 2010 yes. 11. So we had the version from May 2010 to June 2012, mm -hmm. then another version from July 2012 to June 2015. Mm -hmm. And uh, the current version, which came in f into force in July 2015. Yes. The ICA is currently in the process of reviewing the code again. That's right. Uh, and a new version will come into effect next year. That's right. And in June this year, the ICA released the final report of its review of the code. Yes. Uh, and that includes the ICA's recommendations for changes to the code. It does. Uh, now, I want to ask you some questions about the code a little later, but first I want to ask you about some of the topics raised in the evidence in the case studies this week. Right. Uh, now, the first of those topics is add-on insurance mm -hmm. sold through car dealers. And earlier in the week, 
we heard evidence about some of the problems that ASIC identified with the sale of add-on insurance through car dealers. Yeah. Did you hear that evidence, Mr Whelan? Yes, I did hear. Uh, now, ASIC um, described the problems that it had identified in reports 470, 471 and 492. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with those reports? But some of them, yes. Some of them? Yes. I I've read some of them, yes. Yes. Have you read each of those reports at some time? Parts of them, yes. Okay. We heard evidence about the sale of add-on insurance through car dealers in the case study involving IAG. You yes. heard that evidence? Yes. Uh, now, are you familiar with the problems that ASIC has identified with the sale of add-on insurance through the car dealer channel? I am. Uh, and do you accept that customers are often unaware of the cost of or the cover provided by add-on insurance products sold through car dealers? Yes. And that many customers pay for cover that they don't need or will not be eligible to claim for? Yes, that's right. Do you accept that there have been many cases where customers have been pressured to buy add-on insurance products in car dealerships? Yes, I do. Uh, and told that they were required to buy those products even when they were not? I'm not sure if they were told that. I can't swear to that, but uh, I am aware that they were pressured into the sale, yes. Do you accept that compared to the amount of premiums paid on add-on insurance products that are sold through car dealers, the amount paid out on claims is very low? Yes. And do you accept that the car dealers who distribute these products earn more in commissions than customers receive in payouts on claims? Yes. Is any of that acceptable, Mr Whelan? No, not at all. And many insurers have now agreed to remediate customers for add-on insurance sold through car dealers. Yes. Uh, QBE is going to refund customers around $15 million. Mm -hmm. Swan will refund customers around $40 million. Yes. Uh, and Allianz is going to refund around $45 million. Yes. Now, as the CEO of the peak representative body for the general insurance industry, have you reflected on what these issues say about the culture of the general insurance industry? Most definitely. And uh, when the Insurance Council was made aware of this through the uh, concerns that ASIC raised with us, it was a concern for the insurance industry because, uh, and the Insurance Council because if we saw this as having a uh, very poor effect on uh, the image and perception of the insurance industry amongst the general community. So we embarked uh, from about 2016 onwards in a combined effort with ASIC uh, to have a whole of industry approach to this, as you will know, something in the order of half the, uh, the, uh, the, mar the market, the insurers uh, marketed these products. So it really required a whole of industry approach to deal with it. You would have heard that uh, many companies were reluctant to make the first move to adjust their products because of the concern about losing competitive advantage. This is a very common issue uh, with these sorts of matters. Uh, so the Insurance Council took on a multi-pronged approach to deal with these products because there are multiple issues to be dealt with in these products. It's not only the product structure, the pricing, the loss ratios, but also things like the sales practices and the way in which the uh, consumer is informed about the product and uh, the way in which the, uh, the consumer pays for the product, etc. So there are many issues that needed to be dealt with simultaneously and uh, the Insurance Council did take on uh, to uh, undertake with members to move them along a path with ASIC to reform these products and improve the consumer outcomes. Uh, so, can I ask you again, having reflected on those issues and all of the problems that you've just identified, um, what they said to you at the Insurance Council about the culture of your industry? Yes. And I think it, it's, it's informative to think uh, why companies go and, uh, into these sorts of products. At the end of the day, it was, uh, as you would have heard in previous evidence, uh, the uh, car dealers were the, seen as the customer. Uh, as opposed to the end customer. And it was all about uh, gaining a market share of a particular distribution to get access to be able to sell more profitable products through that distribution. So in essence, it was a competitive strategy to be able to enhance the, 
uh, the performance of individual companies through that channel. Um, I think that on reflection, um, as you would have heard from some of the companies involved, they may, may have well reconsidered that approach, given that the products do have some ut utility with some customers, uh, limited as it might be, uh, it was used as a mechanism to gain greater market share of broader markets. Well, I want to put to you that um, these issues indicated that there's a culture across the industry which prioritises making money over serving the interests of customers. Do you accept that? Certainly in that case I would have to say yes, that's true. And they show an industry that's willing to take advantage of customers' lack of understanding of complex financial products to sell them things that they don't want or need. Do you accept that? Well, certainly in the case of add-on insurance through car yards, that's very true. Yes. And they also show an industry in which insurers don't adequately take responsibility for intermediaries acting on their behalf. Do you accept that? There, there is an issue with that as how those intermediaries were trained and monitored in terms of their sales practices, yes. And do you accept that insurers were not taking responsibility for intermediaries acting on their behalf? In that particular channel, I'd say yes. Yes. Now, you said that the ICA has worked with ASIC in coordinating the general insurance industry's response to these issues. Yes. Uh, in late 2016, ASIC established a working group yes. with insurers and the ICA, car dealers and consumer groups to address these issues. Yes. And that working group met a number of times in early 2017. Yes, it did. Uh, now, I'll come back to the working group in a moment, but before ASIC established the working group in late 2016, did the ICA do anything to identify or address the issues with the sale of add-on insurance through car dealerships? Well, we had been clearly warned by ASIC that this was an issue, and so it was raised uh, at various times in the board uh, around how this may impact on the insurance industry's reputation. Uh, so it was well known that uh, action had to be taken. Um, so we went down a path within the Insurance Council of looking for the most practical and pragmatic way of dealing with this issue. Uh, the first thing that we looked to do was to try and cap commissions. Uh, so we looked to a, putting a submission to the ACCC to have a universal cap on commissions from what I think was the highest commissions being paid around 79% of premium to 20%. Um, when did that occur? When did you take that step? Uh, I, th I think it was in 2017. But yes, I, I, so, I, so I'm just going to ask you to focus for now um, on what the ICA did before the establishment of the working group in late 2016. Uh, in the period when you've accepted that ASIC had clearly warned the industry of these issues and it was well known that action had to be taken? I think all we were doing was building the uh, uh, commitment to actually taking a, a, a full action across the industry, so yes. all players. We're building a commitment to taking action. Yes, and a recognition that the industry needed to act as, uh, as one on this through the working group. Okay, so you group. were building a commitment and recognising that the industry needed to act in a unified way. ASIC had released reports 470 and 471 in February of 2016, is that right? Yes. Uh, and report 492 was issued in September 2016. Yes. But the concerns expressed in those reports weren't new, were they? No. Um, they related to conduct that had been going on for years. That's right. And the data that ASIC used in those reports related to the 2013 to 15 financial years. Yes. And those reports built on earlier work that ASIC had done on the sale of consumer credit insurance through car yards in report 256. That's right. Yep. Uh, and report 256 had been released in October 2011. Yes. Uh, and after that, ASIC repeatedly raised concerns about consumer credit insurance and add-on insurance, both with individual insurers and the insurance industry more broadly. Do you accept that? Yes. And the ICA was aware of all of this before the working group in 2016. Yes. Um, but the action that the ICA took was to build a commitment to taking action. That's right. 
Should the ICA have done more, Mr Whelan? There are some limitations of where the ICA can actually act. Uh, we have you know, uh, to be very careful about the Corporations Act and how we may be seen to be collusive, particularly in areas of competition. These products, as I mentioned before, were strategies for enhancing the competitive advantage of individual companies. Uh, so we had to tread very carefully about how we went about uh, coalescing the industry to be able to act on this as, a, as an entity. Um, and I think uh, we did uh, as much as we could to build that consensus that something needed to be done around this uh, and to give the companies the time to be able to withdraw or to adjust these products from the marketplace. So working within the limitations of uh, the ICA's uh, legal restraints, I think we did as much as we could. Well, did the ICA do anything to investigate how its members were selling add-on insurance through car yards? We were aware how they were selling it. It was we were informed by ASIC, uh, so we were aware we were aware of how it was being done. Um, but being aware of how it was done, um, the steps that you took were just to build a consensus about the action that should be taken in the future. Is that right? A recognition that uh, an action needed to be taken across the industry. Well, you, you've told us in your evidence that one of the functions of the ICA is to build trust in the general insurance industry. That's right. That's a key purpose of the ICA's work, isn't it? It is. So what better way to do that than by taking proactive steps to address the concerns um, about the way that add-on insurance was being distributed in car yards and harming consumers. I understand that, um, uh, but we have limitations in the actions that we can take. We are uh, a member-based company, uh, it's, it's voluntary, um, and uh, for us to enforce upon the members to withdraw from a market or change a product is really outside the powers that we have. We're not a regulator. The sort of action that I'm talking about, um, Mr Whelan, um, I'm not intending to suggest that it's regulatory action. I'm putting to you that it's action that is a critical part of building and maintaining trust in your industry. Do you accept that? Yes, I do. And I think uh, uh, by bringing these matters to the board and discussing how we might deal with this and uh, getting the board to understand the concerns that uh, consumers would have and the way in which this may impact on the industry's reputation was a way of building that uh, commitment to actually changing the way in which these products were marketed in the marketplace. I see. But in the meantime, consumers continued to suffer detriment as a result of these practices. Regrettably, yes, that's true. So in early 2017, uh, the ICA participated in the working group that I've mentioned. Yes. And what did that working group produce? It produced a, a submission uh, to the ACCC to be able to cap commissions uh, and uh, was starting to evaluate the ways in which the product was marketed and sold in the car yards themselves. Did the working group also um, develop principles for product design, distribution and sales? Uh, yes, it did start to work on those sorts of matters, yes. Right. And, and were they formalised? Were there principles produced for product design, distribution and sales? There were requirements uh, from memory that needed to uh, qualify uh, an individual, inform the individual that, uh, whether they were actually suited for that product, that training needed to be enhanced for the distributors uh, who were selling that product. Um, and ultimately uh, we arrived at the need for, uh, after the ACCC submission failed mm. uh, to get passed, uh, we arrived at the, the deferred sales model yes. as the preferred mechanism for what? controlling these products. Can I ask you questions about both of those things, about the deferred sales model and about the submission to the ACCC? Yes. So starting with the deferred sales model, um, can you tell us what that proposal would involve? So uh, one of the problems with uh, how the product was being sold uh, at the time was it uh, was done in conjunction with the main sale, which is the motor vehicle. Uh, so in the process of arranging finance, etc., people were encouraged to take out these add-on insurance products and the, uh, the funding of that or the premiums were bundled into the finance for the motor vehicle. So they were sold conjointly 
with the main, with the main product. Um, and uh, what the deferred sales model uh, does is it says that can't, can't be done in uh, any sale of add-on insurance has to be separated from the sale of the main product and the proposed uh, time of the separation is four days at this point in time. Uh, and that, that gives the customer the uh, opportunity to consider a proposal to buy add-on insurance and whether it's suitable to their particular needs uh, and make a decision as to whether they would take up the product. So under the proposed deferred sales model, is the customer given uh, an information sheet yes. on the first of those four days? Yes, it's, it's, they're meant to be qualified for the product uh, and then given uh, an information sheet that uh, informs them of the, uh, the, the product features and benefits. What does it mean to be qualified for the product? Whether they could actually claim on the I product. I see. So, so we've, we've had that problem before where some people have sold these products that could never actually claim. So there's an assessment to be made of their eligibility to claim under the product? Yeah, the proposal would be that they would be qualified, yes. Uh, and then an information sheet given on the first day. Yes. Uh, and does that information sheet indicate that uh, op I'm sorry, that add-on insurance is optional? Is that part of the proposal? It would be, and or then, it should be. And then what happens at the end of the four-day period? Uh, the, it's up to the customer to contact uh, the, uh, uh, the provider of the product, the car dealership, uh, but uh, not, the car dealership is not to contact them. So it, it goes back to the customer's discretion as to whether they want to take up the offer. And what kinds of problems do you expect that the deferred sales model will address? Um, I think, firstly, it reduces the uh, pressure on uh, individual customers uh, who uh, are simply wanting to buy a motor vehicle uh, in many instances. And uh, uh, it separates away uh, the uh, features of a given product so that people have time in a calm uh, and collected environment to be able to assess whether those products actually have any real benefit to them or not. And do you think that a deferred sales model on its own will be uh, sufficient to address the issues with these sorts of products? We had the view that uh, the commission cap was also necessary uh, to uh, adjust the pricing of the products as well because if the comm commission cap is reduced uh, to what we, we proposed was, was 20%, uh, that would reduce the cost of the insurance as well, uh, the price of the insurance. Now, come to the commission cap, but does the deferred sales model uh, address the low value of the products uh, demonstrated by the low ratio of amounts paid to customers in claims compared to amounts paid by customers in premiums? It should do if the customer is making an informed decision. That's the principle of the deferred sales model. It gives the customer the power to make a... Uh, informed decision away from an a pressure sales environment. So given that the customer makes that decision and makes that determination that the product actually is suitable to them, that they do believe that there's a benefit and that they accept that that price is a fair price for that benefit, then theoretically that should reduce the, uh, the well, it should increase the sales ratio, the loss ratios on those products because they will be able to claim. You, you said that at the end of the four day period uh, it's up to the customer to contact uh, the car dealer under the proposed deferred sales model. Is that right? My understanding that it, it should be the customer that makes the uh, determination of whether they want to take up the offer. Can I just ask that you look at Exhibit 9 uh, to your statement, okay, okay. Um, which is ICA 0020011653. And this is a letter from um, the ICA to ASIC on the 23rd of October last year. Yes. Uh, in relation to consultation paper 294 on the sale of add-on insurance and warranties through car yard intermediaries. Mm -hmm. uh, can I take you to 1657 in that document, which is a diagrammatic representation of the proposed uh, deferred sales model? Mm -hmm. And do you see that in this diagrammatic representation, we see on day four at the end of the deferral period that the intermediary initiates contact with the customer to yes. see whether they want to purchase the product? Yes, I'm sorry, that's correct. 
That, yeah. So that is the way the proposal is to work, with contacts still coming from the intermediary at the end of the four-day period. Yeah, that's the proposal. It's not necessarily how the deferred model will actually be. Right, but that's the way the ICA would that's like been presented, the yes. deferred sales model to work. That's how it's been presented, yes. Um, Otherwise, there will be a lot of sellers ringing the uh, purchaser of the car four days later saying, oh, how's the car going? That's right, Commissioner, yes. Oh, while we're talking. Yes. Yeah. But this is the proposal of the ICA. It is, and that's the consensus, I guess, of the membership uh, involved in this, uh, that that's how it should uh, should perform. Uh, whether that plays out the uh, eventually, that's really down to how ASIC sees it. Well, wouldn't it be better for your proposal to be one that had the customer initiating the contact at the end of the four-day period, as you had thought the proposal um, indicated? That's right, yes. Well, my view would be yes. Yes, but that's not the consensus view within the ICA? Not at this point, no. I see. All right. Uh, other changes that have been proposed to deal with the add-on insurance issue relate to the monitoring and supervision and training of intermediaries, is that right? Yes. Uh, and do you agree that one of the causes of the problems identified by ASIC in relation to add-on insurance was that insurance companies weren't doing enough to monitor and supervise their intermediaries? Yes. And what steps has the industry agreed to take to improve the supervision and monitoring by insurers of their intermediaries? Well, uh, this will be a part of uh, the revised code of practice uh, that will require uh, that insurance companies who use intermediaries uh, who are under their AFSL, uh, are authorised under their AFSL, that they will be required to comply with the code of practice in full. So uh, all the provisions around uh, how a customer is treated uh, and the service standards that uh, apply to that as per the code will be required of the uh, distributor of the product. I want to come to those revisions to the code, but over the period that was covered by reports 470, 471 and 492, did the code impose obligations uh, in relation to the supervision and monitoring by insurers of their intermediaries? Uh, I, they were there, but uh, they weren't enforced from what I can see. And why was that? I believe the, the companies uh, simply left it to the uh, individual distributors to uh, act as they saw fit. So um, the code obligations existed, you say, but were not observed by the industry? It was open to the industry to be able to apply those uh, provisions if they so chose. And did uh, they? Uh, I can't speak for all of them. Uh, some may have, uh, but uh, given the nature of these sales, I can't say that they were properly monitored. So you accept that there was non-compliance by significant numbers of insurers with those provisions of the code? Yes. And were there any consequences for that non-compliance with the code? They would be considered breaches if they were identified. Mm -hmm. uh, and what would happen upon the identification of those breaches? They would be required to rectify those breaches. I want to come to um, enforcement of the code. I'll come back to that topic. Um, but. The final report of your review of the current code yes. uh, that was released in June this year, which deals with your recommendations for the next iteration of the code, yes. contains a recommendation that the code be changed to clarify that all third parties operating under an insurer's AFSL are subject to the standards of the code. Is That's that right? Yeah. And that includes car dealers? Yes. Uh, and you've also recommended that the code be changed to require insurers to have policies and procedures requiring employees and distributors to conduct sales appropriately and prevent unacceptable sales practices. That's Is that right? right? That's right. Uh, will the code impose requirements on insurers to monitor distributors and make sure that they are not engaging in inappropriate conduct? The requirement will be that they do that uh, so that they don't breach those provisions of the code. I think going back to your previous question, it was really up to the insurers to, to make the determination of how they monitored those sales 
So the new code wants to make that absolutely clear that it is the responsibility of the insurers to take responsibility for how their products are sold by operators who distribute their products under their AFSL. And what makes you think that this time the industry will observe those obligations when they haven't observed them in the previous iterations of the code? Well, I think this has been a salutary lesson for the industry about how these products have uh, impacted on the image of the industry and the way in which the industry is portrayed in the marketplace. And I think uh, given uh, the understanding that uh, the industry now has and the way in which ASIC has moved uh, on a number of matters, including uh, their enhanced powers and so on, the industry is under no illusion that they need to uh, undertake a much more rigorous approach to how distributors sell their products. But it took um, the events that have been, uh, that I've taken you to with multiple reports released by ASIC over many, many years um, for that lesson to be understood? Regrettably, yes. Yes. And what makes you think that the lesson now has been understood? I think the industry has come under and will come under far more scrutiny as a consequence of these matters um, and some of the matters that have been brought in front of the Royal Commission. Uh, my hope is that these uh, have a positive impact on how the industry responds to these sorts of issues and how it uh, deals with customers and how the distributors of those products deal with customers. Because the code has not been able to achieve that purpose, has it, Mr Whelan? It has in limited uh, respects, but clearly there's been failures uh, and uh, there's no excuse for these sorts of failures. Customers have had uh, detriment as a consequence of that, so there's no excuse for that. Uh, all we can do as the Insurance Council is try and reinforce and strengthen the provisions that we have to try to build higher levels of service and more accountability within the structure of the industry. What does it say to you about the adequacy of self-regulation in the insurance industry? That it has limitations. That it, has... A, that it has limitations, but it has always had limitations. And all regulation has limitations. Where we think that it works best is in co-regulation, <coughs> where we can work with uh, black letter law uh, and have uh, the flexibility and capacity to adjust through self-regulation. So the combination of the two would be our view of the most uh, effective way of building increased uh, service levels and standards within an industry. The black letter law that you work with is very limited, isn't it, Mr Whelan? It does have limitations, yes. Uh, I, I mean, there's very little black letter law governing the insurance industry. Do you accept that proposition? Well, there's the Insurance Contracts Act and the yes. Corporations Act yes. uh, and the ASIC Act. So there's there's at least three levels of black letter law, at least. Do you accept that compared to other financial products, the black letter law that applies to insurance products is much more limited? Uh, I can't really speak for how it affects other industries. Um, we've always had the view that the industry is heavily regulated uh, industry and uh, with strong oversight from uh, regulatory structures, APRA and ASIC in particular. Uh, so I'm not sure I could agree with that, that particular proposition. Mm -hmm. Now, in your final report about uh, the next iteration of the code, yes. the ICA has also recommended that the code should be accompanied by best practice product design and distribution guidance yes. that would apply to add-on insurance sold through car dealers. Is that right? That's right. There's a specific uh, paragraph that go to add-on insurance through car dealers, yes in this guidance that um, yeah. is annexed to the code, is that yeah, right? that's right. And that's not going to be included in the code itself? It, it will be annexed to the code. The reason why we weren't able to incorporate that in the current uh, draft of the code was that we were waiting on the legislation that was being developed by Treasury for uh, ASIC's product and distribution powers. So that had not been finalised uh, when uh, we were drafting, uh, when the final report had been put out and we were drafting this. So we didn't want to necessarily have in our code or our draft uh, something that wasn't uh, going to be adequate enough for the, for the law. Mm -hmm. So we needed to see what the law was going to say. So what you've done instead is create an appendix which contains best practice guidelines. Yes. Um, which won't be enforceable because they're not part of the code? That's right, that would be voluntary, uh, 
but we will have uh, the advantage that the final version of the code has not been fully drafted yet. Uh, it's not <coughs> due to go in front of uh, the ICA board until November for review and approval. Uh, so we're hoping uh, that any further information that we can incorporate into the code uh, through uh, knowing about the legislation uh, may assist us to bring that into a more forceful structure into the code. And if you don't know about the legislation by November, it will remain as an appendix best practice guideline? Yes, but the, the, the point I would make to that is that this is one of the advantages of the code is that if, if uh, something occurs that fundamentally changes the structure of the industry through legislation or whatever it might be, then the code has the capacity to adjust. So it can reincorporate something like that into the code to keep pace with the, the needs of the, the marketplace at the time. So that flexibility is one of the key benefits of a self-regulatory system. But it seems to generally take a number of years for the code to be amended. There's a three year time frame that is locked in for the reviews, but it doesn't preclude the industry from undertaking interim reviews, which we have done as you will be aware, during the 2011-12 floods. natural disaster. And uh, we made some adjustments and put in some very prescriptive issues around claims handling timeframes and dispute resolution timeframes. Now, I want to take you to the commission cap yes. uh, that you've mentioned a couple of times <coughs> already. Um, uh, an idea that came out of the working group yes. was to cap commissions to uh, uh, payable to car dealers for the sale of add-on insurance. Yes. Uh, and the ICA coordinated a request by its members to the ACCC uh, to implement a proposal to limit the commissions and other benefits payable to car dealers um, for insurance product sales. Is yes. that right? Yes. And it was proposed that the commissions would be capped at 20% of premiums. That's right. And ASIC had found, as you acknowledged earlier, that in the 2013 to 2015 financial years, commissions had been as high as 79% of premiums. Yes. Now, the HCC refused to authorise that proposal. Yes. Uh, but insurers, you, um, I think, have told us in your statement, have taken steps to reduce commissions voluntarily. Is yes. that right? Yes, some have. Yeah. Um, some have? Yeah, as far as I, I'm aware, some have reduced their commissions. And what proportion do you know of the... No, I couldn't, I couldn't give you an estimate of that. Uh, do you know if it's most or less no. than that? I think it might be less than that, but I'm not sure. Uh, has the ICA been monitoring reductions in commissions payable to car dealers? Um, no, I, I'm not familiar with us monitoring that, no. Has the ICA been monitoring other payments made to car dealers, such as volume-based bonuses? As I understand it, part of the uh, agreement uh, to reduce commissions uh, voluntarily or whatever, was to also avoid volume-based payments. Uh, are some insurers still paying volume-based bonuses to car dealers? Not that I'm aware of. And do you agree that commissions uh, and volume-based bonuses paid to car dealers were a significant cause of the problems that ASIC identified in its reports? Yes. Uh, and in particular, do you accept that conflicts of interest that can be created by high rates of commissions and volume-based bonuses. Yes. Especially in circumstances where many car dealers operate at a loss or on very small margins. Yes. Uh, and you accept that many of the car dealers were therefore dependent on revenue from commissions. Yes. Do you agree that in those circumstances, high commissions and volume-based uh, payments were particularly likely uh, to create incentives to engage in poor sales practices. Yes. Now, uh, Mr Whelan, are you familiar with the conflicted remuneration provisions in the Corporations Act? I'm not familiar with it, but I am aware of it. Uh, do you know that those provisions came into effect in July 2013? I wasn't aware of that, no. Um, do you know that they prohibit certain monetary and non-monetary benefits from being given to or received by a person who provides financial product advice to retail clients? I accept that, yes. Uh, including general advice. Are you aware of that? I'm not fully aware of that, no, but I accept that. 
Now, since those provisions were introduced in 2013, monetary and non-monetary benefits provided in relation to general insurance products have been excluded from their operation. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of that? Uh, no, but I accept that. Well, do you accept that a general insurance company can pay as much as it wants in commissions in relation to the sale of general insurance products? Accept that. Yes. So, given that the general insurance industry has recognised the need to reduce the amount of commissions paid to car dealers in relation to add-on insurance products, would the ICA support a legislated cap on those commissions? I see no reason why we wouldn't, uh, given that we put the proposal to cap the commissions in the first instance. Um, having it legislated would seem to be a reasonable outcome. Would the ICA support a legislated ban on those commissions? I'm not sure banning commissions is the appropriate uh, response. I think uh, there is work that is done that uh, should be remunerated in an appropriate sales environment where the product is properly presented, the customer is properly informed and the distributor has done the work to make sure that the product has been appropriately sold. So I don't see any reason why that shouldn't uh, generate some kind of remuneration. So banning commissions entirely would, I th would be, I think, a retrograde step. But the, the idea of these excessive commissions around 70, nearly 80 per cent of premium are exorbitant and uh, encourage all the sorts of uh, behaviours that you were mentioning before, Ms Orr. Well, are the costs of commissions for intermediaries passed on to consumers in higher premiums? Uh, they would have been in the premium, yes. Yes. And do you think it's necessary for the general insurance industry to pay commissions to intermediaries? I think it is where the intermediaries have actually added value to the sales process. Um, in the cases that we're talking about with add-on insurance, I find that very hard to prove that they added any value. Mm. Uh, Mr Whelan, why should the entire general insurance industry continue to be exempt from the ban on conflicted remuneration? Well, I think it has given flexibility to the industry uh, across a wide variety of channels that it operates in, and that means that it gives uh, customers access to products that may not they may not have had otherwise, and I think those, those channels need to be remunerated. So I, th I think maintaining some level of flexibility there is reasonable, but I grant you that, you know, where it uh, reaches those excessive levels like we've seen, uh, that, uh, that is something that's unacceptable. Mm. Um, so why not remove the exemption on the ban from conflicted remuneration insofar as it applies to the general insurance industry? Well, our, pre our preference would be that the industry acts uh, voluntarily to do that themselves and makes the decision themselves rather than have that legislated. Uh, has the industry made that decision or taken any steps to make that decision? Well, clearly not in the case of uh, add-on insurance through car yards, no. In the um, case of any general insurance products? I think there is a, 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 a level of uh, market uh, acceptance based on, uh, I guess, market factors that limit the extent to which uh, commissions are paid in different distribution channels. It is a competitive factor uh, in, uh, in the marketplace. Um, and I think there's a, a, a general market practice but uh, legislating that, I think, is a very different matter. And that would some be something that would have to be looked at in terms of the unintended consequences. Let me put it to you this way, Mr Whelan. If the payment of a benefit could reasonably be expected to influence the choice of financial product that's recommended to a person or the financial product advice that's given to the person, why should a product issuer be allowed to continue paying that commission? Well, they shouldn't. Uh, be unduly influenced through the Commission to choose the product. That's, I guess, my point, is that uh, an appropriate distribution model would be that the customer's interests are put as the primary interest, that the product is sold appropriately, that the customer's made an informed decision, and then a Commission is paid for the work that's been done to uh, give that product to the, the individual customer. So I think where uh, you're going is around that the, the, the distribution is incentivised to sell ad, a, inadequate product or an inappropriate product on the basis of commissions. And I think that's, it, that's not acceptable to do that. But you understand the concept of conflicted remuneration, where a product issuer is influencing the advice that's given. 
You understand that? I do understand that. And yes. should that be permitted to continue in the general insurance industry? No, it shouldn't be permitted. All right. Now, the next topic I want to ask you about, Mr Whelan, is the handling of insurance claims following natural disasters and yes. severe weather events, which was the subject of case studies in recent days involving AAI and UI. Yes. Did you hear that evidence? I did, yes. Um, now, the ICA plays a role in coordinating the insurance industry's response to natural disasters, is that right? Yes. And what role does it play? Uh, so when there is a major event, uh, the Insurance Council determines uh, the extent of that event and applies criteria as to whether it will declare a catastrophe. Uh, there are a number of criteria that we use uh, to determine whether we declare a catastrophe. The reason that uh, we do that is that it invokes a, a task force approach across the industry mm -hmm. that coordinates the efforts of the individual companies that have a particular footprint in that in that area, uh, have a, a you know major claims uh, exposure in that area, uh, and we coordinate the activities of the uh, individual companies. We liaise with the local authorities and the emergency services people to facilitate uh, access for insurance companies to, to the areas, uh, to uh, assist in uh, information transference between the industry and those authorities, local government, state governments, etc. And the purpose of it is to facilitate a speedy and effective response to these events. Now, you tell us that in 2010 and 2011 there were significant issues connected with insurers' responses to Cyclone Yasi and the widespread flooding in Queensland and New South Wales. Yes. And what lessons did the industry learn from those events? Uh, well, quite a number. Uh, the, the size of these events, I'd have to say, were extraordinary. They were unprecedented and so the industry was uh, very stretched to be able to deal with uh, both the size of these events and the geographic areas in which they were spread and the extent of the damage, which was extraordinary. Uh, so uh, a lot of work went into how best to be able to respond to these, uh, these events with uh, federal government as well as state governments, etc. So the insurance industry played, the insurance council itself played a pivotal role in being able to assist government to uh, find best ways in which the industry could respond uh, through their actions and the industry's actions, coordinate the two. Um, there were significant issues around uh, how uh, communication was uh, made with customers, uh, the extent to which they were kept informed about their claims, uh, the frequency with which they were communicated with, the time frames that uh, claims were managed in and handled, the extent to which uh, individual claimants were actually able to make a claim um, and uh, issues around uh, policy structures like uh, that most particularly uh, flood insurance versus storm damage, which uh, at that point in time was still uh, an issue for the industry. Uh, now, one of the case studies uh, this week concerned the bushfires at Wye River. Yes. Uh, did you hear the evidence given by Mr Dransfield in that case study? I did hear some of it, yes. Uh, now, um, that case study highlighted, one of the things it highlighted was uh, particular terms in home insurance policies issued by AAI. Yes. Uh, one term that was highlighted allowed AAI to choose to settle a claim for a cash sum equal to the lowest quote that the insurer could obtain for the relevant repairs, yes. even if that quote was less than the insured could reasonably achieve. Yes. Are you familiar with that sort of term? Uh, yes. And are you aware that terms of that nature were identified by the government um, as an example of unfair contract terms in its proposals paper on extending unfair contract terms protections to insurance contracts? Yes. And does the ICA support the use of terms uh, such as that by its members? Well, we don't get involved necessarily in uh, how policies are constructed and the terms that the individual companies uh, determine. That's really up to them to make that decision. It's a commercial decision on their part. and that product stands or falls in the marketplace based on that. So that's not uh, an issue that the Insurance Council will take up. But the Insurance Council has provided a response to the government's proposals paper on extending unfair contract terms protections to insurance contracts, hasn't it? Yes, it has. 
uh, and I just want to explore some aspects of that with you. Yes. Uh, it, it might be best to go to the proposals paper first mm -hmm. to see what's being proposed. Yes. Uh, that is RCD 00210025001. So this is the proposals paper released in June this year by the government. Yes. And if we turn to 0005, on the first page we see a summary of the existing position. Can I take you to the third paragraph? Mm -hmm. In 2010, unfair contract terms laws were introduced which apply to all sectors of the economy and to all businesses operating in those sectors who use standard form contracts in their dealings with consumers. In 2016, these laws were extended to provide protections to small businesses from unfair contract terms. While the UCT laws apply to most financial products and services, they do not currently apply to insurance contracts regulated under the Insurance Contracts Act. Now, the Australian Government has decided to extend the unfair contract terms provisions to insurance contracts. They're in discussion with us on that. Well, this document contains their proposed model, doesn't yeah. it? Uh, and so underneath the part that I read to you, we see that um, the proposal is to, if we go down to the dot points, mm -hmm. to amend section 15 of the Insurance Contracts Act to allow the unfair contract terms laws in the ASIC Act to apply to insurance contracts regulated by the Insurance Contracts Act. You see that? Yes. And to tailor those laws to accommodate specific features of insurance contracts. Yes. Now, one feature of the existing unfair contracts terms regime in the ASIC Act is that it does not apply to terms of a contract that define the main subject matter of the contract. Is that right? That's correct. Um, but the main subject matter is not defined. Yes. Uh, and the proposal, the proposal of the government, is that the main subject matter of an insurance contract would also not be subject to the unfair contract terms regime. Yes. But the main subject matter would be defined for an insurance contract uh, as what is being insured. Yes. For example, a house, uh, a person or a motor vehicle. Yes. Uh, so that terms that describe what is being insured, insured would not be subject to the unfair contract terms regime. Yes. Um, but other terms of the policy, like the limitations, the condition precedents and policy exclusions, would all be subject to the unfair, <coughs> excuse me, contract term regime. Yes. The ICA does not support that approach, does it? No. Um, it says that the main subject matter should include any terms that define the risk that is being covered. Yes. And that would include any limitations or exclusions under the policy, wouldn't it? Well, the extent to which that goes to price, yes. Well, what would be left, Mr Whelan? Well, quite a number of things would be. There'd be uh, quite a number of ancillary terms in a contract that may not go to directly to the price or define the, the, the nature of the contract or the bargain which the insurers are taking on. A ancillary terms, you say? And that would have to be determined because those uh, any term that didn't uh, necessarily uh, be defined as, sub as the subject matter of the contract, uh, defining the risk, mm. uh, could be considered ancillary and could be challengeable. But you accept that the limitations and exclusions under the policy are terms that define the risk that is being covered? They may do, in yes. the extent, uh, for example, uh, if a policy excludes flood, that will definitely go to the, 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 uh, the price of the, the risk. So I want to say to you again, what other than ancillary matters would be left for the coverage of the unfair contracts terms regime? Well, all I can say is that anything that is outside those terms which go to strike the bargain or the, the, the nature of the risk being taken on by the insurer. But they are the important terms, the terms that are capable of being unfair, are they not, Mr Whelan? Well, I'm not sure they are. 
it's your term to say that they're unfair. Well, uh, that are capable of being unfair. The sort of terms that the unfair contracts terms regime is designed to address. Do you accept that? The, the counterpoint to that is that if you were to challenge those terms that actually do go to what defines the bargain or the risks being taken on by the insurer, you introduce a level of uncertainty into that contract, mm -hmm. which may be unacceptable to an insurer and def definitely unacceptable to the reinsurer. Uh, that, that, that the insurer relies on to be able to take up that risk. Well, so I, I think we, we need to be very careful, and this was how we responded to the government on this, we need to be very careful about what is acceptable to be challenged in terms of the contract arrangements and what terms are s essential to defining the bargain in the contract and what terms may not be. And those that are, are not are definitely challengeable. Well, I want to put to you, in relation to this point about contractual uncertainty, Mr Whelan, for many years there have been provisions allowing courts uh, to declare contracts void uh, if they're entered into, for example, as a result of unconscionable conduct. Yes. Um, uh, why is this any different to that? Well, you know, unconscionable conduct is, I, I guess, one matter, but all I'm saying, and, and the response that we have on this particular matter is that we're not adverse to unfair contract terms being incorporated into uh, insurance contracts, provided that those terms that actually are essential to defining the risk that the insurer is taking on and are clear to that are actually protected from being challenged. Otherwise, I'm, I'm, I would be concerned that the industry would have to either rewrite or reprice their entire products or withdraw from some markets because the, the ability to, uh, to define the risk was, would not be uh, certain. Well, in what respect is the problem you identify different from the application of unfair contract terms to banking contracts about lending? Well, uh, yes, reasonable point, but I, I guess all I can say is that the insurance contract uh, is about defining what uh, the residual risk that an insurer will take up uh, in uh, a given situation or for a given event. And if uh, the insurer can't be certain as to the nature of that risk and the extent of that risk, and it's open for challenge at any point in time, then it's very difficult to price that risk. I can't speak for the banking sector, I'm, Commissioner. I'm not asking you to speak for the banking sector at all, uh, but I'm concerned to have you grapple with uh, a more general and basic point. Provision of financial services uh, generally, uh, at least often, perhaps usually, involves the provider of the service forming an assessment of risk. Do you accept that? Yes. That is to say, many contracts for provision of financial services are contracts the terms of which and the willingness to enter into by providers will be moulded by assessments of risk. Yes. Risk of the counterparty not performing, risk of the counterparty uh, uh, doing something that will uh, uh, enhance the possibility of loss to the uh, provider of the service. Yes. What is it that makes the insurance industry stand apart from other forms of financial services when it comes to uh, this particular subject of unfair contract terms. Now, I, I understand you to say insurance is quintessentially concerned with pricing risk. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Well, if the law is there are some terms that can be judged to be unfair, what exactly is the problem that that creates 
in the pricing of risk? Um, yes, okay. Well, all I can say is that uh, we would take the view that uh, there would be particular terms in a contract that are essential for that contract to work and to be acceptable to both parties. Uh, and those terms are the ones that go ultimately to how the product is priced. So the insurance contract is all about risk. It's a risk assessment process. So uh, the contract is really all about defining what is essentially that that goes to the risk. And what we argue is pretty much what uh, has been put in place in the uh, European Union and the UK is to say that there are terms within the contract which should not be challengeable because they actually do define essentially the risk that's being undertaken. And to challenge those would introduce this uncertainty. And I think that's, uh, that's all I can say about how the insurance industry approaches this, this matter. Commissioner, could I tender uh, the June 2018 proposals paper on extending unfair contract terms protections to insurance contracts? Treasury proposals paper June 18, extending UCT protection to insurance contracts, RCD 0021, 0025, 0001, exhibit 6.405. And could we please bring up ICA 0020040001? Now, uh, is this document, Mr Whelan, the Insurance Council's response to that proposal? Ah, uh, yes. I'll tender that document, Commissioner. Letter Insurance Council of Australia to uh, the Treasury, 24 August 18, ICA, uh, 0002, uh, 002, 004, 001, uh, Exhibit 6.406. Now, Mr Whelan, the natural disaster case studies that we examined earlier in the week also raised issues in relation to the handling of insurance claims. Yes. And ASIC's powers under Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act don't currently extend to the handling of insurance claims because claims handling is excluded from the definition of financial service. Yes. Um, you say in your statement that the ICA is open to considering the need to remove the exception in relation to general insurance. Yes, we have an open mind on it. Do you agree that general insurers should be subject to an obligation to do all things necessary to ensure that they handle insurance claims efficiently, honestly and fairly? Yes. Uh, now, do you agree that general insurers should be subject to an obligation to ensure that their representatives are adequately trained and are competent to handle insurance claims? Yes. Do you agree that general insurers should be required to report significant breaches of those obligations to ASIC? Yes. Uh, and do you agree that ASIC should have the power to enforce those obligations, including by instituting penalty proceedings where they're breached? Yes. All right. Now, could I turn to the General Insurance Code of Practice? Uh, we've already touched on a few aspects of the code and the ICA's recommendations for the next iteration of the code that will be introduced next year. Yes. Um, one of the recommendations involves adding a new section to the start of the code to state up front the key commitments of the code, as well as to articulate the spirit, intent and objectives of the code. Is that right? Yes. Was that idea based on a similar section in the Life Insurance Code of Practice? Uh, yes, uh, to some extent, although we, we had our own view about, uh, about that without necessarily reference to the Life Insurance Code. But, um, and there's also something similar in the Banking Code. So we already had a view that we wanted to be able to articulate in a clear and simple way to customers what it is that the industry is committing to to service their needs. All right. Can I show you the equivalent part of the Life Insurance mm -hmm. Code, which is RCD 0021-0023-0001. This is Exhibit 
Now, if we turn to 0004, we see clause 1.4, which tells us that the objectives of the Life Insurance Code are to commit us to high standards of customer service throughout your relationship with us, to seek continuous improvement within the life insurance industry, to communicate with our customers in plain language where possible, and to increase trust and confidence in the life insurance industry. And in clause 1.5, we see that the principles that apply to our products and services that are covered by the code are clarity and transparency, fairness and respect, honesty, timeliness and communications in plain language. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you expect the equivalent section of the General Insurance Code will say? It'll certainly uh, canvas those sorts of issues. I mean, the, the principles are of fairness, honesty, openness, transparency, efficiency, they're all things that are embedded in the code. Uh, but the, the purpose of the upfront commitments is to say to customers, these are the things that the industry will definitely commit to, that will uh, be uh, Im implemented across its processes to make sure that uh, when they're dealing with you, that they're uh, undertaking all of these principles as they uh, manage their relationship with you. So these sorts of things will be incorporated. Uh, we're currently drafting them now. So we're trying to get the best possible way of describing these things without making it too laborious for customers to read. Will the key commitments extend to the design and distribution of general insurance products? They could. Uh, will they? Well, we haven't finalised them yet, but I see no reason why we couldn't be able to put that in. Now, one proposal that was considered in connection with the recommendation to state key commitments was to include a reference to corporate culture. Yes. Uh, and the ICA decided not to accept that recommendation? Yes, because I think it's an extremely difficult thing to define. What I'm happy for us to be able to communicate is the principles and ethics that the industry would uh, uh, abide by uh, and whether that goes to individual corporate culture, that's another matter. But uh, it's essentially how the industry wants to portray itself to, uh, to the customer. So what are the principles and ethics that you think should inform corporate culture in the insurance industry? Well, it should be about a customer-centric model. It should be about putting the interests of the customer first. It should be about understanding the customer's needs fundamentally. And it should be about designing products, processes and services that actually fulfil those needs to a high level. And do you think that corporate culture in the industry currently conforms with those principles? By and large, I think they do. Do you think there's room for improvement? Always room for improvement in any system, and, and ours is certainly has room for improvement. Uh, did you hear the evidence given by the two witnesses from Allianz earlier this week? Um, no, I'm sorry, I didn't. Well, they gave evidence about misleading and deceptive statements that appeared on the travel insurance pages of Allianz's website for up to six years. Right. Uh, and Mr Winter from Allianz said, in relation to that incident, that it was more important to Allianz to protect the bottom line than to stop misleading its customers. Well, that's unacceptable. Well, in light of that, would you agree that there would be value in the code addressing issues related to corporate culture? Well, I think the, to the extent that you're, you're pointing out where profit uh, uh, precedes <laughs> customer interests, I think that's worth putting that po point of view forward, that that shouldn't be the position, as I mentioned before, there should be a customer-centric model where the interests and needs of the customer are paramount in any of the dealings and relationships that the industry has. And I think that is an antithesis to a profit model which puts profit ahead of customer. Do you set, accept that the evidence that you've heard given in the Royal Commission this week is not um, demonstrative of a customer-centric model? Oh, clearly, they were terrible instances and, and very distressing for those customers. Now, five of the ICA's recommendations uh, in relation to changes for the next version of the code relate to disclosure of information about insurance policies. Yes. Uh, and availability of and access to information, would you agree, is a key assumption that underpins the current product disclosure scheme? Yes. 
Uh, and is it fair to say that the ICA believes that the current disclosure regime comprised of product disclosure statements, financial services guides and key fact sheets is failing consumers? Yes. Why? Uh, it was a, a structure uh, that was imposed on the industry uh, some years ago under the uh, Australian Financial Services um, uh, Amendments that occurred over 12 years ago, I think. Um, and the structure of it was, uh, at, at its principle, that the more information you provided, the better informed the customer. And it's a fundamentally flawed principle. Mm. Uh, but the industry has had to comply with that uh, for that period of time. But it's clear to us that that has been inadequate. And we undertook uh, to do research in this area, mm. uh, which you would have seen the number of reports that we did. And the key thing about that, that it, there was no research before that. And so we understand that one of the principal concerns that the industry has to grapple with is the failure of the uh, customer to be able to understand the products that they're buying and the, the features and benefits of those, of those products. And the, and the expectation gap that occurs as a consequence of that when not understanding the product and the product not performing in a particular instance when the customer goes to make a claim is this uh, major cause of uh, concern for the industry and, and effect on the industry reputation. So we're looking for ways now through doing empirical research to find ways of better informing customers to make sure when they need the, the information that the information is delivered to them in a usable, effective form so that they can make more informed decisions. So in 2015, uh, you established something called an Effective Disclosure Task Force. That's right. Uh, and that task force produced a report called Too Long Didn't Read. Yes. Uh, now, that task force considered research into the way that consumers use general insurance disclosure. And I want to take you to just uh, some parts of what the task force said about the research at that point in time. Yes. Uh, can I take you to exhibit 10 of your statement, ICA I'll, I'll say the number again in case I said it incorrectly. ICA 0020011671. Now, this is the report yes. uh, that the ICA produced. If I could ask um, that we have 1691 on the screen. Now, at the top of this page, we see the discussion of consumer research, and the task force said that it conducted a literature review into previous research that has attempted to measure the effectiveness of disclosure. The review found no empirical research around how general insurance consumers actually use disclosure documents and the impact of these documents on decision making. The existing research specific to general insurance, while instructive, is constrained by their reliance on consumers self-reporting knowledge and use of disclosures. The lack of empirical research has been a significant barrier to the task force being able to reach firm conclusions about the effectiveness of disclosure. Uh, now, the task force went on to consider the research that was available and recommended that further research be undertaken. Is that right? Yes. And the ICA has undertaken further research? Yes. Uh, and in February last year, the ICA published a consumer research report. <coughs> yes. Can I take you to that document, which is Exhibit 11 to your statement, ICA 0021738. Just before I take you to that document, I'm sorry, can I ask you uh, another question about this document before we move away from it? Yes. Could I show you 1694? Uh, 
No, I'm sorry, 1694. We see towards the bottom of 1694. ICA 002 001 1671 at 1694. <laughs> You see a discussion starting towards the bottom of the page of the consumer understanding of general insurance. Yes. Could we bring up the following page as well, 1695? We see that over the page, the task force recorded at the top of the page that research commissioned by ASIC into consumer understanding of home insurance suggests that consumers generally know very little about home insurance, with many assuming that all policies are the same. And then in the second last paragraph on the page, of concern, Field research into customer attitudes conducted by IAG suggests that not understanding insurance seems to be socially acceptable. Interestingly, the research indicates knowledge does not appear to correlate with level of education. Consumers from diverse socioeconomic backgrounds show similar shortcomings in knowledge about insurance. Whilst other equally complex financial concepts such as interest rates are generally well understood, knowledge of basic insurance concepts seems to be much poorer. It was put to the task force that the banking sector is much more advanced in their financial literacy and customer engagement programs. In contrast, unless a claim needs to be made, insurers have traditionally only had contact when a policy was taken out or renewed. However, there are strong arguments to suggest this strategy is not leading to positive outcomes. Now, uh, they were the um, views expressed in your report, Too Long Didn't Read, yeah. in October 2015. Uh, and there was then further research conducted by the ICA. Uh, and in paragraph 36 of your statement, you deal with the five key findings as a result of that research. Uh, into c consumer um, behaviour mm -hmm. when buying insurance. Yes. Can I take you to paragraph 36 of your statement? And the five key findings were that there is no single pathway to purchase and the use of information in decision making is highly varied. While most consumers report they have evaluated the details of their policy, most do not access the PDS. While most consumers are confident in their understanding, comprehension appears to be poor. Many consumers do not consider the specific risks for which they need to purchase cover as a criterion for decision making. And the accessibility of the PDS can be improved although there are other opportunities for stronger consumer engagement. Now, do you think that the insurance industry has a role in increasing Australia's, Australian's financial literacy in relation to insurance products, Mr Whelan? Definitely. Uh, and has the ICA taken steps to do that? Yes, we've um, uh, developed some time ago uh, a, a program in, uh, the principal component of which is a, a website that we have uh, called Understand Insurance. Yes. And the concept behind that is to provide customers with a customer friendly, easy to understand guide to all aspects of insurance right through from defining what type of insurance you want to buy or need. Yes. Right through to how you might go about making a claim, right through to how about you may go about making a complaint. So it canvasses the, the, the entire process in a way that would assist consumers to make decisions about uh, 
what type of insurance they might want to make. Are you aware that the most often cited problem with mandated disclosure documents is their length and complexity? Yes. Are you aware of research that suggests that retail consumers are not likely to read documents that are more than two to three pages in length? Yes. Uh, and that studies have shown a decline in decision quality when consumers are provided with information beyond a certain level. Yes. Uh, and that studies show that decision making is most effective when consumers are presented with more than five but fewer than ten attributes for a product choice. Yes. Uh, now, um, what is the ICA's proposal um, beyond the Understand Insurance program of dealing with these problems? Well, the entire process of uh, the Product Disclosure Efficiency Task Force is about finding the best possible ways to inform customers. And that research that we've uh, recently concluded uh, shows that people come at these uh, issues and these matters in different ways. Not everybody's the same. Mm. So one size doesn't fit all. So we need to find different ways that uh, people can make choices and to access information in a way that suits their particular needs at the time of their particular need. That the, the barrier we come up against with insurance, as you've just sort of seen in some of those comments, is that it's a low interest category. People have an optimism bias uh, that these things are not going to happen to them and they take uh, very little interest in uh, insurance per se. Um, that's understandable. Um, but at the end of the day, it can cause real problems if they think if they just buy an insurance product, it covers everything that they think they could be at risk for. And those sorts of things are the areas that we're trying to find ways of informing customers about what is the risks most likely to affect them, what are the areas that they need to pay attention to, how can they go about getting that information, and what's the best way that the industry can deliver that information that makes a difference to how they make a decision about an insurance product. And that's the principles behind which we're working on this idea. When we've been pushed into things by government, such as the key fact statement which was required of us uh, just after the 2011-12 uh, floods, um, we, we went ahead and did that. And, and the idea of that was a single sheet, you know, minimum amount of information about the policy. People don't use that. Uh, our research showed that they didn't use that as, as well. It's a low interest category. So we need to find mechanisms to stimulate interest, stimulate inf information, and make sure that that information is transferred effectively. Now, another of the ICA's recommendations in relation to the next iteration of the code is that certain amendments um, should be made to meet the requirements for ASIC approval of the code. Is yes. that right? Yes. Uh, and those changes include clarifying that the code is enforceable through the oversight and sanction powers of the Code Governance Committee. Yes. Um, through FOS taking code breaches into account when determining disputes. Yes. Uh, and through enabling the Code Governance Committee to report systemic code breaches and serious misconduct to ASIC. Yes. Why does the ICA want ASIC to approve the code? Well, I think it's, it, it's a uh, way of uh, giving confidence to the marketplace and to customers that um, the key regulator of uh, conduct in the industry has agreed that this code is an effective, useful consumer instrument and it's prepared to uh, accept that and approve it. And I think that's a, a seal of approval, if you like, which will carry weight in the marketplace, uh, I think, as to the bona fides of the, uh, of the code. Do you think it will change the behaviour of your members in complying with the code? Well, it's the uh, uh, instruction of the board that uh, we undertake this and, and ensure that we can get uh, ASIC approval of the revised code. So uh, they represent uh, the vast majority of the, uh, of the industry, so it's their, their will to, to do that. One of the things that ASIC looks for before approving an industry code of conduct is whether it's enforceable. Yes. You understand that? Yes. And that's why to meet that requirement you've recommended amending the code to make it clear that it's enforceable through the oversight and sanction powers of the Code Governance Committee. Yes. And the Code Governance Committee was established as a result of the last review of the code. The Enright Review, yes. In 2014. Yes. And it's had the power to impose sanctions on insurance companies for breaches of the code yes. since the 1st of July 2014. Yes. 
And we see from the statement of Ms Linnell Briggs, the chairperson of the CGC, that since the 1st of July 2014, the CGC has determined that there were breaches of the code in 33 cases. Yes. Uh, and code subscribers have conceded breaches of the code during an investigation in 689 cases. Yes. Uh, and code subscribers have self-reported a further 31,000 odd breaches of the code. Yes. And do you know how many times the CGC has used its powers to impose sanctions on general insurers in response to those breaches? Yes. How many? None. None? Yes. Does that really give you confidence that the oversight and sanctions powers are an effective means of ensuring that the requirements of the code are enforced? I think, uh, to put context to that, the uh, sanction powers of the CGC are predicated on the fact that those breaches have not been remedied. So the, the sanction powers only kick in if the, the breaches that have been identified and reported to the CGC are not remedied and uh, resolved or corrected. Uh, if that's the case and they don't correct them or they don't correct them within the agreed time frame, then a sanction is uh, applied. Um, other than that, it's not applied. And the purpose of, uh, I guess, part of the self-regulation is not so much just to sanction, it's to remedy and fix breaches. And that's what they've been able to do is in their interaction with the individual companies that have breached the code, they are able to get the breach remedied and fixed. And uh, that way, uh, the customers uh, going forward will be dealt with properly. So I think, yes, they haven't had to use the sanction powers because the industry has actually reacted and responded to the breach notification and fixed the problem. Well, why not have a model, Mr Whelan, that requires the Code Governance Committee um, not just to ensure that the breach is remedied, but also to impose sanctions for the breach? That's not part of the code at this point in no, time? No, um, I'm asking you why not have that model? It may be a discussion that the CGC could bring to us as a, a point where they may feel they would like further powers. It's open to them to do that and that would be a discussion that we would need to have at the board level. Well, we see from the statement of Ms Briggs that the number of code breaches has been increasing year on year. Do you accept that? Yes. Um, so are the corrective measures, the um, remedial action, sufficient? I think it's, it's uh, partly because people are taking the, the code and its breaches much more seriously, that there's an increase in compliance uh, philosophy within these companies and that's driving higher levels of breaches. There's also the fact that we've had natural disasters which tends to drive up breaches but I also think there has been an increase in the compliance me mentality within companies. You would have seen some changes that have occurred as uh, some poor behaviours before that compliance is now much more highlighted in companies. So I think those things have occurred. Um, I'm not necessarily convinced that just bringing in uh, sanctions for the sake of it will necessarily have a major impact on uh, the breaches. I would rather that we remedy the breaches and fix the breaches rather than just have sanctions. Well, I'm not talking about bringing in sanctions for the sake of it, uh, Mr Whelan. I'm talking about bringing in sanctions because of the necessity for some denunciation of the conduct of the insurer that has resulted in a breach. Look, there is an argument, and I grant you, that a uh, potential of a sanction can act as a deterrent uh, in the first instance to a breach, so I agree with that and I understand that. Mm. That's a point which uh, may be brought forward to us by the CGC uh, as uh, an enhancement of its powers, so I can accept that and the board would uh, um, debate that and discuss that. Well, on the topic of deterrence, Mr Whelan, uh, you heard the evidence of Mr Storey from UWE earlier in the week. I did, yeah. Uh, and I asked Mr Storey what he understood the Code Governance Committee could do in response to a possible breach of the code. And after some hesitation, he said they could certainly investigate us for that, I would imagine. And he added that they could request further information and clarification. And he said that he was not aware of anything further that they could do. Yes. Does it concern you that representatives of general insurers aren't even aware that the CGC has sanctions powers? 
Well, in that case, it does concern me and, and it's something that we will take up with Yui. Uh, but uh, perhaps uh, other companies are more informed and particularly their compliance people are more informed uh, about the potential uh, for sanctions to be applied to them if they breach. Um, certainly, uh, we know that the major companies are aware of that. I can't speak for Yui. Clearly, that is uh, a lack of understanding within, uh, within that organisation. Well, what sort of threat does it impose to all general insurers when from the period from the 1st of July 2014 to now, the CGC has not imposed a single sanction for breach of your code of practice? Well, it hasn't worked necessarily on the basis of threat. It's worked necessarily on the basis of uh, information and understanding of uh, where insurers have fallen down and haven't uh, performed. Most of the time, those breaches, if you look at where they uh, occur most frequently, they're around timeframes, failure to meet timeframes in uh, both uh, claims handling and decision making and uh, in provision of information to the claimant uh, at, that is appropriate to the particular claim. So it's around time frames. And do you accept that those time frames are very important they measures are. for the protection of claimants? I agree, mm. uh, but they are things that can be corrected through process change and training. And that's what's been done through the breach notification and the uh, relationship between the CGC and the individual insurer. So those things have been fixed in those instances where the individual companies have breached the code. The ICA doesn't support making the code enforceable by incorporating its terms into contracts like the banking code of practice, does no, it? No. Why not? Uh, a couple of reasons. One, we don't see uh, that there is that much ad advantage to customers uh, through uh, incorporating it into the contract. The current code and the code going forward uh, are essentially a mixture of um, prescribed uh, requirements such as time frames around claims and uh, dispute handling etc but it's also very much around best practice uh, around guidance and around principles and ethics uh, which are very difficult to incorporate into a contract of insurance so I think those sorts of matters um, are best dealt with uh, in a code that stands in its, in its own right and that's how we've uh, approached it as I understand it, ASIC has an encouragement to uh, that uh, going down that path of incorporating in the contract, but not necessarily is it a strict criteria for them to give approval. Their most concern about is enforceability of the code, and that's where we think we have a robust structure to be able to do that. Uh, so you don't think that what you've described as best practice guidance and principles and ethics should be part of insurance contracts with customers? They don't translate very well into a contractual terms. Um, do you know that under the Competition and Consumer Act, a breach of an approved industry code of practice is treated as a contravention of that act? Uh, yes. Why couldn't that be an appropriate approach for the general insurance code of practice? Uh, well, is that not already the case, that if they could pursue it on that basis? On what basis, Mr Whelan? So I'm not, not clear about your question. Perhaps you could... Re re so re under the Competition and Consumer Act, a breach of an improved oh, industry HRC. code under that Act yeah. is treated as a contravention of the Act. Right. Um, why couldn't that be an appropriate approach for the general insurance code of practice, that a breach of it is a breach of statute? Yeah, sorry, I, did, I didn't uh, fully understand your question. Um, my concern would be is that is... Uh, Contrary to how we've developed the code, the code is essentially a voluntary code um, and that has got a wide coverage as a consequence of it being a voluntary code. Um, and to make it subject to those provisions that you've uh, uh, detailed would, I think, seriously reduce the level of uh, commitment to the code by, yeah, by members. The codes with which the uh, Competition and Consumer Act is dealing are themselves voluntary codes, at least as I understand it. Uh, yes, I think, yes, that may be true, Commissioner. But, uh, they are also mostly between um, companies and other companies, as I understand it, not so much between companies and customers. Well, I just want to understand that answer, uh, Mr Whelan. Are you saying that the general insurance industry is only willing to include meaningful consumer protections in the code 
um, if it isn't a breach of statute, if it fails to comply with those consumer protections? Well, I, I, would, I would suggest that we have uh, a, a fairly strong enforcement criteria within our existing voluntary code, and I don't see why we would need to bring it into statute. Can I square it up this way? If the promise has value, What's the downside in making breach of the promise a contravention of the Act and open all the remedial consequences that follow for breaching the Act? Um, it, I guess it, it would have its implications for the industry and how it moves forward um, and uh, whatever consequences that would have. It would be something that we would need to evaluate if that was the view uh, that we were... Uh, presented with. I personally don't think that that would be uh, necessary, uh, but we would have to evaluate it. And the horns of the dilemma I'm trying to uh, outline for you are uh, these. The promise is either worth something or it's not. If it's worth something, What's the downside in making it enforceable? Yes, I understand. Yeah. I have no further questions, Commissioner. Dr Bell. Yes, I have some re-examination. Um, uh, Commissioner, um, uh, Mr Whelan, in the context of the questions just being um, asked, um, is it the case that consumers, customers, can effectively enforce the code at the moment by making a complaint to FOS? Yes, they can. Uh, the FOS uh, is the dispute resolution system that we subscribe to, uh, external dispute resolution system, and uh, customers can get redress for a dispute or complaint through that mechanism. Uh, now, Ms Orr uh, asked you some questions in relation to sanctions, uh, uh, which can be imposed by the Code Governance Committee. Yes. Um, and um, you had an exchange about a distinction between remedies and sanctions. Yes. Um, can I ask you this? Does the Insurance Council have any control uh, over or as to whether or not the Code Governance Committee imposes sanctions? No. And why is that? is that? Is there some structural reason for that? We deliberately structured the Code Governance Committee to be separate and independent from the Insurance Council. Right. And who are the three members of the Code Governance Committee and, and who do they represent or where do they come from? There's a consumer representative, uh, usually from consumer law. And who is that at the moment? Uh, Brenda Stagg. And is she the same? Uh, lady who was mentioned in yesterday's case study. Yes. Thank you. And, um, and uh, then there's an industry uh, representative, uh, Andy Cornish, who uh, cannot be a, a member of an insurance company. And, and when you and say he cannot be a member, is that... Cannot be an employee of an insurance company. Is that enshrined in um, the constitutional documents? Yes. And, and there's an independent chair. Uh, and that's Ms Briggs? Ms Linnell Briggs. And her background was in? The public service. Public service, thank you. Now, um, can I go back just to the beginning of the uh, cross-examination? And um, Ms Orr began uh, by uh, referring to the um, a consumer uh, liaison forum. Yes. Uh, and. You indicated, I think, that it had some ICA representatives, but also representatives from the main consumer lobby groups. Yes. Um, what, can you just identify, if you can, what, what those consumer lobby groups were? Um, it's in my, uh, in my statement, I think. It's uh, in the statement, then. West End Justice. Uh, rehearse at all, I don't think. No. Thank you, Mr uh, Commissioner. Um, and and you, there was also mention of an independent chair. Of That's that. right. Uh, who was that, do you know? Uh, Mr Robert Belville, ex-insurance uh, company CEO. Thank you. Um, now, you were um, 
asked about the, um, in the context of add-on uh, insurance, um, it was uh, put to you that there was, uh, the, the working group was formed uh, at the instigation of ASIC in yes. late 2016 and that there were meetings in early 2017. Yes. Um, and Ms Orr was asking you about what uh, the Insurance Council had done prior to uh, the formation of that working group. Um, Mr Commissioner, could the exhibit 1-158-9 uh, be brought up on the screen? That's, um, that is um, uh, ASIC 0900.001.0372. What's the document, Dr. Bell? It's, 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 a, it's a letter from ASIC to the Insurance Council, but the significance uh, of the 25th of May 2017, but the significance of it, Mr Commissioner, and I may be able to short circuit this, um, it refers to a submission put in by the Insurance Council in August 2016, yeah. well prior to the formation of the working group and which contained a detailed submission by the Insurance Council in respect of add-on insurance. and. I was uh, th the purpose of that document, which I understood was on the system, uh, and oh, well, Ms. Orris, I see it may not have been uh, up, up, uploaded. That's uh, my difficulty. But yes. uh, Mr. Commissioner, uh, if it's convenient, uh, may I ask the the, the witness? Um, is that it? Yes, that's it. The wonders of modern science, Dr. Bell. Yes. My note is it is an exhibit, exhibit 1 158 9. Now, um, um, when it was made an exhibit, I don't know. Um, but all I'm drawing your attention to, uh, Mr. Whelan, is the reference to um, the ICA submission of the 2nd of August 2016. Yes. Do you recall that the ICA put in a detailed submission on add-on insurance prior to the formation of the working group? I regret I hadn't recalled it beforehand, but uh, yes, clearly we, we did. Uh, and I guess it goes to the point that we were active on this matter for some time, um, apart from my attempt to, to say that we were trying to build a consensus across the industry. We did have concrete ideas about what we what could be done to address these concerns. So it wasn't that we were uh, inactive or incompetent uh, around this. We were seriously concerned about it and we were looking for ways to work to address this issue. Very well. And, um, um, and um, you also gave some evidence about the commission caps. Yes. Um, are you able to uh, recall whether the um, activity by the Insurance Council in relation to um, seeking ACCC approval, did that involve uh, activity in 2016? Sorry, I'm not sure what you're alluding to. The, the, the application for uh, authorisation under the competition legislation yes. in relation to the proposal uh, for a cap on commissions for add-on insurance. Yes. So that's the, the topic. Yes. Can you recall whether the work that was done leading to that application began prior to the formation of the ASIC working party? Uh, yeah, there was a long lead time into developing that proposal uh, and that was our first plan of approach to, to address these exorbitant commissions. And what did that lead time involve? What were the practical steps? 
Well, we had to obviously develop a, a model that would uh, be acceptable to the ACCC. We needed to uh, engage with uh, the member entities and uh, external advisors about how we could go about doing that and what's the best way to put that structure together uh, and then formulate uh, a submission. Uh, and did that involve a legal application or lawyers? Yes, through uh, Gilbert and Tobin, yes. Thank you. That was ultimately rejected in 2017. Yes. But is your evidence that the lead time meant that that work started well prior to the ASIC task force? Oh, well prior force? to it, yeah. Thank you. Um, now, you, um, in relation to unfair contract terms mm. and your exchange with Ms Orr mm. about uh, a carve-out mm. uh, uh, in terms of matters which went to risk, yes. etc. Um, you made reference to um, the relevant European Union approach, yes. uh, which I think uh, is indicated in the most recent uh, communication by the ICA to the government, which Ms Orr took you to and tendered, yes. is the Insurance Council's uh, preferred position. Yes. Um, and is it, are the terms of uh, the European Council directive uh, carve out, are they the terms which are referred to in 200, paragraph 245 of your witness statement? If you just get to turn, turn up. That. Yes. That's the European Union approach? Yeah, 19 slash 13 EEC, yes. Thank you. And if you just turn back in your witness statement to paragraph 240, um, yes. there are references there to various submissions which the ICA has made to uh, government at various levels uh, over a number of years in relation to yes. this proposal. Yes. Uh, and you obviously had an exchange with Ms Orr about the merits or otherwise of the formulation. Yes. But what does one find in these reports a more detailed analysis of the issues? Yes. Thank you. And some of the reasons why we took the initial view that the Insurance Contract Act provisions and the amendments made to it uh, most recently uh, were more than adequate protections for consumers under that under that act, but we were willing to uh, consider how UCT could be applied to insurance contracts that provided we could be assured of uh, protecting the, the subject matter of the contract. Mm. Um, in your exchange with Ms Orr about um, uh, that issue, you ventured to suggest that the um, proposal uh, in the broad form uh, that she was putting to you uh, may be unacceptable to reinsurers. Yes. Now, can I ask you this? After the demise of Reinsurance Australia Corporation and GIO Re, yes. uh, are there any other current Australian reinsurers in the market, or does the Australian indus insurance industry rely exclusively or overwhelmingly on foreign reinsurers? On foreign reinsurers. Thank you. Uh, and um, what implications, uh, if any, uh, in terms of potential impact on premium do you uh, see there could be in the event that there was uh, a loss of certainty in terms going to the commercial risk uh, if a, a, a carve-out of the kind proposed to you by Ms Orr were implemented? Well, it, it's a calculation of risk, uh, again, and the reinsurers would consider the contracts of Australian uh, insurers to be uh, more risky, uh, more uncertain, and a price would be struck on that, which would be no doubt greater than the price it is today. So that uncertainty uh, concern would be priced into the contracts with existing insurers. 
and that would flow through to uh, increase in premium. Basically, premiums reflect uh, the cost to the industry and one of those major cost inputs is regulation and reinsurance costs. Thank you. Um, and Yes, thank you. Um, Mr Commissioner, am I right to assume uh, that the exhibits which accompany um, Mr Whelan's statement be taken as tendered together with his statement? Thank you. Um, I have no further re-examination, but I would seek leave to tender and provide to the Commission um, the 2 August 2016 uh, report to the, um, uh, or, or response to ASIC, which was referred to in the document that was brought up in the screen. It's not currently an exhibit to Mr Whelan's statement, but it is relevant to the question of the timing of the um, Insurance Council's response. There was a suggestion, I think, uh, it may have been a suggestion that that timing, that that response only really came after the establishment of the workforce. I'd seek that leave. It's not electronically on the system, but uh, we seek the leave to uh, provide that to the Commission and, and to tender it, it having been referred to in evidence and referred to in... We, we think and we're checking that it may be an exhibit to a statement uh, given by Mr Sadat in the first round of hearings. It may well be. And in that case, it won't need to be tendered, Commissioner. Very well. If it's already in... Um, uh, well and good, and perhaps um, my colleague, my learned friend, can uh, will draw the commission's outside, attention uh, to the exhibit number. Take it outside the hearing room. Yes. Yeah. Thank I apologise for that, but thank no. you, Mr. Commissioner. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Whelan. You thank you. Step down. Commissioner, the next witness is Ms. Lone from the Financial Services Council. If we could have a brief uh, adjournment just to allow um, the Financial Services Council's team to come to the bar table. Uh, if I come back when, Ms. Or Within a few minutes, if, if possible, I come back Commissioner. Shortly after five past. Thank you. Yeah.